Um, hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this is going to be a, a really fun hour together. And I'm glad you're here. Uh, I'm joined by my friends and colleagues, Ben Sandell and Art Sherwood. Um, we're going to each take a minute to introduce ourselves, and then we'll get rolling on the topic. Uh, first, I want to say that I'm here on behalf of CDS Consulting Co-op, and we are doing this project in conjunction with Food Co-op Initiative. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to be part of this series of webinars um, on, uh, along with uh, the other uh, CDS Consulting Co-op consultants and the Food Co-op Initiative staff. So we really appreciate uh, Stuart Reed and those folks inviting us to do this. Um, so let me go ahead and have uh, Ben Sandell, you introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. Yep, this is Ben Sandell. Um, I was the uh, president and on the founding team of the Friendly City Food Co-op in Harrisonburg, Virginia. We opened last June, uh, June of 2011, um, and are doing pretty well so far. And I am doing some work uh, with CDS Consulting Co-op, but primarily I'm trying to bring the perspective of someone who has been through the entire uh, startup process from start to finish. Thanks, Ben. And Art Sherwood. Hi, everyone. Um, I am uh, trying to bring the perspective of someone who has worked with uh, several different startup groups. Um, I'm also a, a member owner of CDS Consulting Co-op, as well as the president of Blooming Foods. But the three that I had worked with were a farming uh, marketing cooperative uh, called the Local Growers Guild in southern Indiana, and worked with them from idea to uh, bringing basically in a director. I also have worked with the company shops down in North Carolina and have worked with them in their transition from an operation run by a board to bringing out a general manager. And finally, have am currently also working with the Tacoma Food Co-op out in Tacoma, Washington, uh, who have also been transitioning from uh, a board that have been working for years to bring that find the city a co-op, have done their work, and have brought on a general manager, their store is open, and they're rolling right along. Nice. So each of us are, are trying to offer uh, specific perspectives on the conversation. All of us have our own experiences, uh, and then what we've learned from other good folks we've gotten to work with. Today, we're really trying to focus on um, the idea that startup groups are teams of people trying to accomplish something, um, eventually, uh, hopefully, turning into a, a board of directors of a co-op. And all along the way, we need to pay attention to uh, how the team functions, what processes we use, how we make decisions. And so we're going to spend some time just giving a, a, a sense of how to think about all of those basic things when you're in the midst of a startup project. So we're going to begin today looking at uh, what are some of the special challenges for startup groups, what makes that kind of uh, group or team different than others, uh, and then stepping back from that and, and saying what's typical of groups in general, um, how do groups develop so that we might understand ourselves in the midst of our own project, how what we're experiencing fits into common themes, and then how we can respond. Uh, and be proactive in, in addressing whatever the, the issues are that arise in those common, typical development cycles. Then we're going to spend some time talking about the variety of roles and relationships within a startup group uh, and how we can be aware of those and make those as fruitful as possible. We'll spend a few minutes uh, looking at meetings themselves. A big part of our work, uh, for better or worse, is happening in meetings. And so we're going to look at how we can make meetings more effective, uh, more fun even. Imagine that. Uh, and then lastly today, we're going to take a look at what we've heard of, uh, what we've heard as some common uh, big questions that startup groups tend to uh, uh, face and how um, you might begin addressing those, the ones that are really hard, really big, um, and how you might, uh, might, might approach those within this context of teamwork and good decision-making process. So today, um, it helps us to, to remember that 
we're all here together because of our connection to a startup food co-op group. And some things about that work make this uh, a really special kind of team or group. One is that we're taking on what, if you haven't figured it out yet, you will soon, right? It's an it's a enormous project. Um, this, is, this is not just uh, getting together to plan someone's birthday party. This is, a, this is a major undertaking. At the same time, the people who are doing this work aren't already practiced at doing big projects. So you're having to figure out how to build relationships while at the same time, we're trying to figure out how to accomplish this goal that we have. So we're doing a lot of learning on the job. And uh, there's nothing like experience uh, to teach us all those hard lessons. Um, and one of the things we try to, to be aware of is how can we learn from the experience of others uh, and not just from our own experience. So part of today's conversation will be bringing other groups' experience into the, into the mix. Uh, finally, the, something that's really different about um, startup groups as opposed to other groups is that each of us who comes into such a group our role could, could go through just tectonic shifts. Uh, we, we might start as, as an organizer, a founder. Um, we might eventually uh, move into having a different kind of vendor or, or uh, other kind of relationship with the co-op. Um, we might uh, roll into eventually being a director. Um, who knows? There's, there's so many different uh, ways that we could relate to our co-op and the roles we take on. And that makes it really tricky that, that by the time we figure out how to have one way of interacting with uh, the, the group and with the co-op, then we have a different way to figure out. So those are all special challenges that food co-op startup groups are facing. But at the same time, there's something that's just not so special about startup groups and that, that we, like any other group, um, have certain things that we just have to figure out. Every group has to figure out what your process and structures are. Um, there, there are no such things as groups without structure. Uh, and many groups don't necessarily define it uh, overtly, don't, don't really make it uh, something that's in the forefront of the conversation. But in fact, every group has a structure and, a, and, a, and some process that makes the group function. In addition, that any group that's a decision-making group has particular challenges because of the nature of its role. So if you're, again, if you're a group that's just out to play uh, a pickup game of soccer on the field, um, you have a different set of challenges. But if you're a decision-making body, um, those challenges are kind of universal, whether it's decisions about startup food co-ops or about anything else that you're working on. So today we're going to address this both from the what is generally true of groups and what is specifically true of groups that are trying to start up food co-ops in your communities. So hang on to your hats and uh, enjoy the ride today. We're going to spend a few minutes looking at uh, stages that groups typically go through. And some of you may have heard or seen this uh, framing in the past. Uh, found it very um, useful. Uh, our colleague here today, Art Sherwood, uh, co-wrote a field guide. If, if you haven't yet checked it out, um, we've got some resources that we list at the end of the webinar here, and you can find the links there. But in our Seabuild library, there's a field guide, a pair of field guides, actually, about um, positive board culture. And in that, Art and uh, his co-writer, Joel Kapischke, uh, talk about group development stages uh, from forming, storming, norming, performing, transforming, nothing like a little poetry to, to get us all focused on what we're doing here. And um, I'm going to ask Art, if you don't mind, to kind of walk us through what these different stages mean, um, how we might know what's going on in this stage of development, and then maybe some practical tips that each group could consider as they are facing their own situation within these stages. So are you ready for that, Art? Sounds great. So All right. go right on. Something to tie to what Michael was talking about in terms of the not so special part. Um, one of the things that I hadn't mentioned earlier is that I also, in another part of my life, I'm a, a professor at Scott College of Business at Indiana State University. And 
the idea of how groups form and the idea of uh, team development, these concepts are the same whether it's a co-op working group or it's an executive team in a corporation. These are things that we see over and over and over. And I've literally taught, uh, coached hundreds of teams, and it is predictable that each of the uh, groups will go through these stages. Maybe not exactly like everyone else, but you'll see these along the way. And that's a great thing, because if we know that something's going to happen, we can plan to take care of it in a way that really helps our team move forward. And so our first opportunity, and this is really an opportunity stage, is when we're just getting together, which is called forming. And what's, this is when your team is just getting the ideas, perhaps saying, hey, who wants to be on the, uh, the group that's going to start this thing up? And you're going to start to have some meetings. And one of the things that you want to pay attention to in this stage is both the people side of uh, the equation as well as the tasks that you'll need to be doing. And in this stage, it's when you look down at the practical tips there, both of those first two tips, doing check-ins and doing the get-to-know-you sort of things, starts to build important human connections. And doing that, really sets you up for success later on when things might get more challenging. Additionally, this is a fantastic opportunity to start to come to some basic agreements on how you're going to work together, asking yourselves some really simple sorts of questions. How are we going to do the tasks that we know that are coming? How are we going to communicate with each other? What are our quality standards going to be? Um, what does it mean to even show up on time? Those sorts of things, if you can get some agreements up front, will help you in the next stage. And the next stage is called storming. And this is an interesting time when conflict and debate arises. Now, some folks would say, well, why don't I just skip this stage? Well, the problem is, is that we're humans getting together to do something. Storming or conflict and debate about something comes from basically Two things, or at least two things. One is the fact that unlike when we were in our forming stage, we now have to start to make some serious decisions together and actually do some things together. And they'll start to become disagreements. Well, what should our purpose be? How, what steps should we take in order to make things happen? And not just that, all that amazing diversity that co-ops bring together, well, that starts to come out too. And sometimes that... Uh, is extremely useful for your team to move forward. And sometimes it just annoys the heck out of some folks. And that can get in the way of actually moving things forward, because people start to focus on the people rather than your joint uh, challenges together. And so there's, there's a few things that we can start to do to manage this. One, know that it's coming, so we can start to prepare, which we started to do in the forming stage. The, the, Another thing is you could use someone that can help people through group process. Group process is not just a natural thing for us all to be doing in this sort of setting. So someone in your group might be skilled for it, or maybe you can get someone to volunteer from outside your group to come and help you with uh, working through sticky issues. Another thing is, is that we can start to remind ourselves that, yes, we have unique identities, but we also have a strong sense of shared values. And that's an important glue that will hold us together. Another piece uh, that I would just add in is that we should honor and love the diversity that's at the table, but know that not all the diversity needs to always come out at the table. Sometimes you just need to swallow what you, uh, the way that you normally might be to be able to help the group move forward and uh, say, I'm going to take some steps to help uh, the group um, be effective. Hopefully, what you'll do as a team is work effectively through the storming stage so that you can move on to the next stage, which is called norming. Now, this is interesting because if we've done our work, we've actually already started the norming process in the first stage. Remember back when I said, well, you could start to come to some agreements on what our tasks, uh, how we'll go about doing our tasks. Um, 
in terms of communication, quality standards, and so on. The problem is, is that when we're forming, we actually haven't necessarily worked together before. We don't really know each other well. So now we've got some experience. We've got some experience going through some more challenging issues. We've decided, hey, let's, let's actually set up our group norms so that we can manage our conflict, so that we can make effective decisions, so that we can be people that can make progress moving forward. And so here you can step back and say, all right, let's ask ourselves those same questions again. How do we really take advantage of the awesome diversity on this team and bring it to the table when it's, when it's needed? And how can we still honor it uh, maybe in, uh, outside the meetings um, when it's, it's less uh, important to the problems in front of us? Additionally, you can start to write down some team agreements on how you are going to have a function and getting specifics on the approaches to communication, how you're going to store your work, how you're, the expectations around getting things done and preparing for meetings and so on. So if we do this well, we start to move on to the next stage. And the next stage is where we would like to try to maintain ourselves. But of course, um, as we're performing, we're still making decisions, we're doing different things, and gosh, someone might uh, come in that's not been on our team before and shake things up, which brings us to the point that while you're in a great stage, while everything's going well, you still need to check. You need to pay attention to uh, how your group process is working, how you're doing in terms of following your plans of action and, and uh, uh, holding folks accountable for the things that they volunteered to do. And as you are successful, this is a really excellent time to celebrate achievements, both in terms of I really love working with these people, um, and the people keep coming back, uh, celebrating uh, the approach that you've used while this is really working well, uh, celebrate the things that you achieve, and making sure that everyone uh, um, takes a, a chance to say, we've been doing a good job. Now, inevitably, and I'm sure that you're learning this, as the, the development process for co-ops uh, goes in stages. And you're floating down the river, and you're going to a, a different place than where you started. And so your performance pays off in a way that takes you to the next stage, which is transforming. Now, this is a, actually a pretty challenging time for startups. Um, and this is because the role that you've had up to the point where, say, you hire a general manager or actually open the store. That is a huge transformation. But you'll go through other transformations as well. Oftentimes, the leadership will change. You'll change who's actually on the board. And you'll want to manage that transformation. And planning for that and knowing that that's coming will help set you up for success to do that. And knowing that when you make certain types of transitions, it's natural for some folks to say, all right, well, this one, I'm not going to go along uh, any further. I've done my bit. Oftentimes, you'll have very entrepreneurial folks involved early in the stage of a startup co-op. And when the things start to get down to the details of management, managing it and setting up policy to help uh, hold the general manager accountable, they might move on to their next project. And the key, I think, for that is is to really thank those folks for the incredible work that they've done and make their ability to separate from the group okay because remember they have put in a ton of volunteer time and effort to get you to where you are at that point so our thanks for that I I often think especially when looking at this stage here uh, when a group goes there's there's an assumption I guess that we are moving through stages and it's always forward progress but when I think of this I think of that moment when someone new joins the group we've got that transition that you're talking about where folks who've been part of the group for a while leave and new people come in it seems to me like that's really a time where we're really going right back to that forming stage and that we have to then pay attention to those same things that we paid attention to early on and that that's an important realization that that we are regularly groups are regularly kind of 
um, spiraling through these stages as opposed to just moving through them linearly. Does, yeah, does that make sense to you? Uh, it makes total sense. And in fact, oftentimes I'll draw it up on the board instead of a sequential process, I'll, I'll make it more of a five-pointed star. And this, the idea that you could actually be zipping back and forth across to any of them at any time, and as leaders of, of the group and folks that are part of the group, it's worth paying attention to where are we uh, at this point. Nice. Thank you for that. It's a great image. I love that star image. Um, so as we're going through, I want to remind everyone who's uh, listening in today that you can uh, ask questions through the GoToWebinar interface. And we will definitely have time at the end uh, to answer your questions. But if you're thinking of something as we're going along, uh, don't hold off till then to submit it. Go ahead and feel free to send it in now. So as we're moving forward, um, we want to think about within the context of the group, each of us has one or more hats that we might be wearing at different times, one or more roles that we're fulfilling. Um, roles, uh, I like to think of our role as essentially it's our relationship to not another person, but it's our relationship to the cooperative itself. Um, and so some people have a role as a founder. Um, Art mentioned that word, the entrepreneur, the, the folks who are kind of early stage high energy people that come in and help us move something forward. Over time, one of the uh, primary leadership roles is that of the governor or the director. Um, ultimately, if we're really lucky and, and have done our work well and it all is successful, all the stars align, we might even have the good fortune of having the role as a customer. And each of those roles is distinct. They all ask different things of us. Um, the, as the relationship changes, we have to recognize that. So I want to spend a few minutes here uh, helping you all here kind of think about in your own context, in your own startup, for yourself, what roles you've been in, how you have shifted your own thinking uh, as your relationship with the co-op has changed, um, and how you can help others within your group uh, do some of that same work. So I was hoping that um, before I get into any of the the specifics of this um, piece of shifting roles. I feel like this is a place where, Ben, you have a lot to offer, um, having recently experienced, um, so far anyway, a successful startup project. Um, and you had many different roles throughout that process. And I'm wondering if you could uh, give us some insights about your roles over the course of the project, how they shifted, and then how you managed that shifting as you went along. Sure, I'd be, uh, I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, and I'll start by saying that it is a really great feeling to go from everything that came before to customer. It was really wonderful to walk through the doors when they were open and the registers were ringing and realize I can shop here now. Um, but to start, uh, you know, we started as a group of people who didn't call ourselves anything and then progressed to founding team and then board. Uh, and then hired a general manager and other staff, or one other staff person, who then became the general manager's staff, um, until finally this store opened and we were wrestling with how to be true governors, true board members, rather than uh, all the other hats that we had worn. Um, and there certainly was for us some transition in the people themselves in terms of some people decided that they really were most interested in one particular stage. And when that stage was done, they were done with the work that they wanted to contribute. And that was great. It was, I think, great to have that self-awareness uh, on their part and know that you know either they weren't going to be fulfilled or weren't motivated to do some of the other pieces that had to be done. Um, some people really managed the transition very well, that they could be you know initial dreamers and then move to more of entrepreneurs, fundraisers, uh, and have transitioned into the roles of governors now. Um, I'm impressed by that because I don't think that's easy to do at all. It takes study at every step of the way um, in terms of learning what is your job here now? What are the resources available to help do whatever this particular job is? Do we need you know, a financial consultant when we're doing our fundraising or a fundraising consultant um, versus do we need a uh, someone who's going to help us specifically with board process and long-term 
vision and that kind of thing. Um, so it took effort throughout and, uh, as I said, bringing more people in both at our local level to serve on the board and to be committed volunteers, but also bringing in different consultants throughout the process. Um, and uh, then once, the, once we had a GM in place, then things really changed a lot and we really had to wrestle with how much control we were letting go of and giving to the GM and the GM staff and turning in primarily into fundraisers and marketing people and trying to learn how to be true uh, board members of an operational food co-op. Um, so that was a big shift. And again, that was another point where some people decided to move on and new people came in. Um, but it was extremely exciting. And that, I think, was a big motivator for those of us who stayed through the whole process. Um, well, ben, I'm curious. So you, you mentioned that some people uh, choose to leave at certain transition times. And maybe that's because they had enough, did what they wanted. Maybe something was hard for them. But I'm curious that on a personal level for you, were there were all those transitions easy for you when the roles shifted? Was there any that were particularly hard? Or was it um, just, do you think it's a matter of personality? How did it work for you? And, and why do you think it did? I think that the, to some degree it's personality. And some of it I, I think is groundwork too. And you know, if you have, certainly there were some folks who um, either I really missed when they moved on uh, because of the unique voice they brought to it or a skill set that they brought uh, to us. Um, and it was really kind of sad to see them go. But of course, you know, people also have their own personal reasons, kids and families and all kinds of things, uh, their day jobs. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was a challenge throughout kind of wrestling with that. Um, I think we were really lucky in that we didn't have any situations where, you know, someone maybe stayed on even after they were well out of their their skill zone or their comfort zone. Um, I mean, we never had to deal with that side of things, which was really helpful. It does come up. It certainly comes up where you have someone who uh, has a hard time letting go of an earlier role and wants to bring that forward and may not fully grasp the changes that occur, especially once you have a GM in place and a lot has to get let go. Um, so I mean, personally, it was kind of a bittersweet thing. We were really, I was really excited that we were making the progress, but sometimes you saw people say, you know, I, I'm just, I, I'm not interested in doing this anymore. And it's like, well, gosh, I liked having you. I liked seeing you every month and then at all the meetings between and, uh, you know, uh, we forged a lot of good, strong relationships, but I'm hoping too that some of those people will eventually come back and be good, solid board members in the future. So I guess it's a, just a good reminder for us: some of some of these roles will be easier or harder for people just based on who we are, and there's not much anyone else can do about that. But there are systematic, structural processes we can put in place to make it easier or harder for someone to uh, shift roles as the project moves along. So. Yep, so absolutely. we're paying attention to. Um, so then uh, one of the, the roles, I, I wouldn't say it's a role, but one thing that can happen within uh, uh, any business, or um, any co-op and any startup co-op project, is that we have two roles. One person has two roles which um, really uh, cannot both function well Within the within the project, um, and this is the classic conflict of interest scenario. Um, and conflicts of interest um, really have to do with when, uh, in wearing our two different hats, we're using one role or one hat to gain advantage for ourselves uh, while wearing a different hat. Um, and so we just have to be aware of that. It's it's inevitable that it will come up. Um, and for different people, some I shouldn't say for everyone it won't come up, but but for some people there will be these conflicts of interest, and it's important to be aware of them, to pay attention, and to have a way to um, address conflicts of interest. Uh, I mentioned here on this slide a, a few common um, conflicts of interest that come up in startup projects. Uh, these are stories that we've heard uh, more than once. Um, you know, the the developer who is part of the 
the startup group and also is the person who wants the co-op to buy their property or rent their uh, fabulous uh, storefront. And that's a very classic conflict of interest. The developer has an interest to make money from the co-op, but the, the people working for the co-op have an interest to protect the, the assets of the cooperative and its members and to look for the site that's best suited for that particular business, not necessarily to serve the developer. That's one example. Um, I'm wondering if, um, Ben, in your experience, um, did you have uh, one or more examples of these kinds of conflicts of interest? And could you maybe tell us a quick story and how you all dealt with it? Sure. Uh, and we had conflicts of interest throughout the whole process um, from various people and situations. The one. The most current one, um, at least as far as I know, one of the current board members uh, of our co-op is married to the manager of the local farmer's market. And we have a good relationship with the farmer's market, but you know we're sharing some vendors. We're not sharing other vendors. Some vendors see us as direct competition. So you know he hears a lot of things. There's, there's kind of a firewall that he understands he has to maintain in that his wife comes home and talks about her job. He is also able to talk about certain aspects of serving on the board of the co-op, but he has to be very careful about how his knowledge of the farmer's market informs decisions that he may be making as part of the board of the co-op. In addition to that, the same guy delivers the eggs for a lot of the local farmers, both to the co-op and to a lot of other stores in the area. So he's going directly from the co-op to our you know, competing grocery store a uh, mile away. And uh, of course, they're asking questions about, so how's that co-op doing? And you know, how many eggs are they selling per week? And those kind of things. Uh, and again, he has to be really clear about understanding that uh, he has different hats he wears. And he's not, you know, it's not really, he, he, luckily, he's a pretty graceful fellow in terms of being able to deflect things uh, from like the grocery store because they do ask a lot of questions about the co-op uh, that he just doesn't, you know, he, he tactfully doesn't answer. Um, but it's an ongoing thing of trying to be aware of these when they crop up um, and uh, how you handle them in a manner that's uh, constructive and positive in your community. That's good. It's a great story. It's, again, so common, especially in small communities where many of the, the people who are active in the community are active in many different aspects of it. Um, so the conflict of interest by itself is not a problem. Um, it only becomes a problem if you don't declare it, if you don't make sure everyone's aware of what the possible conflicts are, and then that, that the group, the startup group, has some mechanism for addressing that. There are a variety of ways of doing that. Um, so just pay attention, know that it's going to be there, and be ready to deal. Um, as we move through uh, thinking about our relationships, thinking about team group development in general, um, another thing to pay attention to for uh, startup groups and for any decision-making group is this constant tension between process or product. And process and product is a, is a shorthand way of talking about um, are we paying attention to uh, what we're trying to accomplish. Are we uh, focused on our goal together? Do we know what that is? And are we working towards it? Are we getting things done? Um, so Art talked about that during the, the performing part of uh, the group development where really we're getting things done now. Um, and that's what, why we're together. We aren't together just to sit around and have fun conversations, but we're trying to accomplish something. We have to pay attention to that. Um, whereas on the other hand, process is all those ways that we go about doing whatever uh, that job is that we've agreed to do with each other. And we have to pay attention to process. And at any given moment in the course of the project, you might be spending more time working on the, the getting things done uh, or more time working on how are we doing our work. Um, the idea is that both are important. Neither can take precedence over the other, though at some points one will. And we just want to be aware, are we giving enough attention to the other side of the equation? So last week, uh, the webinar that Ben and I presented um, about structure and accountability, we suggested that one of the things 
that can really help a startup group is to write down some basic agreements about how we will work together. Um, and if you look in the CBuild library, you'll find the template, we call it the, the CBuild policy template for startups. Um, and it starts with just a set of basic agreements about how do we function, how do we, how do we work together. Um, one of the primary sets of agreements that a group ought to make is how do we do meetings? Meetings are a big part of how we do our work, so we want to pay attention to that. Um, and also, uh, how then within meetings, how do we make decisions? As you go through a startup project and, and as your team develops, uh, goes through those development stages, um, your agreements might need to change. And so you don't want to take our template agreements and say, oh, this is, this is the final word. It's just a beginning place, the place to start thinking about your own agreements and to realize that those will change over time. Another great resource to, to think about this, to, to stir the pot in your own group, is to go back to some of those um, webinars and the Food Co-op Initiative series um, that you can find on the CDS Consulting Co-op website. Um, the ones that are all about creating alignment and how do we um, recognize that through the process we have to work on creating alignment uh, among the team. So within that uh, context, meetings, oh my gosh, all of us who are doing this sort of work sit through a lot of meetings. And we want to um, try to make as much as possible, make our meetings be purposeful, not painful. Uh, having sat through more than enough painful meetings, I know that there are some things we can do, each of us, to help a meeting uh, serve us in the way that we'd like it to. The three primary things that I want to focus on today are the um, agenda of a meeting itself. That's a very powerful lever for moving the meeting in the direction you want. The facilitation of the meeting, again, Art mentioned that earlier as a, a, something that a group can do to help move itself through the development stages. And a clear sense of how do we know when we've made a decision. So we're going to go through each of these topics um, one at a time here real quick. I just want to um, without spending too much time on the details, uh, just remind you that um, agendas do matter, that there's a good resource um, uh, of a sample agenda format in the CBUILD library. Uh, in essence, make sure that the agenda has a clear sense of purpose for each item. We know why we're having this particular conversation, whether we're trying to make a decision, whether we're hearing information or report from someone else, um, and how much time on the agenda uh, are we devoting to this topic. When a group at the beginning of a meeting says, yes, we approve the agenda, what you're doing is saying, yes, this is our plan for our time together. This is what we hope to accomplish and the time we're going to take to accomplish that goal. Uh, so again, the agenda is now becomes a tool for the whole group to say, this is, this is our plan. This is what we're, we're agreeing to do together. Uh, skill facilitation, again, uh, something that can be very useful. Uh, there's a lot of ways that groups go about facilitating meetings. Um, the one thing that I would like to uh, suggest today is don't assume that the, the steering committee chair is the person who has to be the meeting facilitator. Many times that works and works well, um, but uh, if that person is either not skilled or not interested or for a variety of reasons unable to both facilitate the meeting and be a uh, participant in the conversation, um, sometimes having someone who's not the chair um, facilitate can be really successful. In fact, uh, here in uh, Burlington, Vermont, where I live, I'm the facilitator for the board meetings. And I'm not on the board, um, but I show up at all the board meetings and help facilitate those meetings. And they continue to tell me it's a service they appreciate. The uh, decision-making rule, uh, it's kind of a funny thing. We have to decide how to decide. Um, we have to say together. Before we get going too far, how will we know we've made a decision? Um, some groups use a parliamentary procedure, uh, which is a process. And within that, there are embedded certain decision-making rules around majority rule. Um, for some things, there are supermajority uh, requirements. Some groups uh, use a consensus process. And the one thing I would like to uh, emphasize here is that uh, it, it's very helpful to keep consensus, use that term, 
to talk about the process. It's the process by which we have our, our conversation. But the decision-making rule um, in consensus does not necessarily have to be unanimity. Um, so that if we can separate out those two uh, concepts, the, the process and the decision-making rule, uh, we can uh, accomplish uh, a lot more, I find. And, and a lot of the startup groups that I work with um, tend to want to use a consensus process. Uh, I think that and parliamentary procedure are both valid um, and useful tools. Whichever one you're using, make sure folks understand it and agree on how you are uh, making your decisions. Um, I wonder if, um, Ben, you would give us a quick sense, actually before I move on, I, I jumped the slide here, um, if you would give us a quick sense of just one way that your board talked about making, or maybe it was your steering committee, however you are identified, how you made decisions, what you did with them, um, how you made that work for you. Sure, yeah, and I want to stress here too that uh, you noted there the decisions do come in sizes, and that can make a difference in how your group makes a decision or uh, comes to a decision. So some things, for us, most of the time we used um, a basic uh, majority rule. So if we, we of course, in order to make any binding decisions, had to have a quorum, and then from there, if we had a majority of the quorum, simple majority agreeing, um, then the decision passed. And that worked for many things. And like an example of a relatively small decision is a contract, a change in one piece of an already approved contract. So, you know, we would bring that back up, make sure people understood this change, and uh, vote on it. Very small, easy decision. Others would be much more uh, emotional. Much, there would be a lot at stake. And at times, we do a pre-vote where we would first go around and say, are we ready to vote on this? And hear whether people were able to say, yes, 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 I'll vote. Or, you know, no, we need to talk about this more. We need more data. We need more uh, research. Um, and we also, at times, use the five-finger method, where if you are voting and you put all five of, you know, fingers of one hand in the air, that means you wholeheartedly agree with the decision at hand. Um, four means you agree mostly, but with some reservations all the way down to you know one finger means I don't agree but I'm not going to block this I will accept this and then no fingers means no I cannot go along with this and that was a way to make sure people were really heard and to tell whether there was anyone really you know unhappy about a particular decision and it usually meant we had more work to do to come to a good decision nice I've never used that five finger method but I've heard several people suggest it as a, a way to again get a quick sense of the group um, and where you needed to do more work in your conversation. So thanks for that. Um, so now back to uh, recognizing again that as we move through a project, our meetings will change, and it helps to think about um, meetings during the various stages. And since that's the, the framework uh, art, I wonder if you could give a quick sense of how you see meetings changing as a group goes through its development stages. Uh, sure. Um, my sense is that one never loses, should never lose sight of uh, pr the product versus process um, framework, but that as a group moves toward a team that's performing, what you have is a shift in emphasis. And where perhaps very early in your process, you have 80% focus on um, process, so in, maybe in the forming stage, and 20% on um, product, that teeter-totter starts to shift as you move toward performance, because you start to get more focused on um, actually getting things done. So by the time you're performing, you're spending 80% of your time on uh, product and running through the task to get things done while still doing a good solid maintenance, maybe at 20% with, uh, with your, your process. Then of course, that all shifts around as you hit transforming events like new board members or a major shift in the, pro uh, the stage of your development, et cetera. So 
we might all think that we're all moving in one straightforward line, but it's it's not quite that way. So just pay attention to that 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 tension between process and product, and that as you move through the stages, um, be be willing and able to shift how how you do your meetings along the way. Um, one thing I want to relate uh, here quickly um, as we get towards the tail end of our presentation and start to open this up to some of your questions. I know there's been a lot of them out there. Is that back? Uh, in early 2011, um, CDS Consulting Co-op, in conjunction with Food Co-op Initiative, did a survey, and, and maybe some of you who are here today uh, participated in that survey. And we started to um, see that there were some common uh, scary questions that startup groups were, were grappling with, questions for which there aren't really easy answers, um, but that were coming up again and again, things that were hard to answer. And I wanted to, um, first off, just say they're going to happen. We're going to have big questions. So Art mentioned, um, has been mentioning you know, the, the easy decisions, the things that are going to be uh, you know, minor changes and something that we've already done, and others are going to be big and hard decisions. Uh, and as we think about having these difficult conversations, um, I want to just leave us in a minute with some ideas about how we handle them. But I know, Ben, you were telling me earlier about uh, at least one time where your uh, group there at Friendly City um, was facing what you all considered a, a, a big question. And I'm curious if you could tell us how that went, what you did with that question, how your process either helped or didn't help you move through that. Um, sure. Uh, well, this particular situation was when we were uh, in the thick of trying to raise our principal financing, um, and we're having some challenges there. It wasn't going so well. And the question came up, well, why are we trying to open a co-op in the first place? Wouldn't it be a lot easier if we just got a major investor who, you know, owned the store and we were all small minority owners and we could get this thing going? And it was um, it was a tense moment, but it was really reflective of, uh, you know, a thought that was in more than one person's head of, you know, why are we doing this? Why is this important to do this as a cooperative rather than as a conventional business? Um, and it was a great way for us to talk more about, uh, to kind of go back to our initial vision and to get back to, okay, why did we try to start this in the first place? What does it mean to learn more about what cooperatives are? You know, it was a great way to kind of refocus us and bring us back um, to some, you know, core to a, to a place that got us moving forward again. Uh, so, but it was a tough moment. So I, I love that you said we go back to some of our core documents, our core agreements, um, that for some groups, a big question like that, why are we even trying to open a co-op, could be so big that it throws us, throws us completely off track and we can't figure out how to regroup and get back focused. And for you all, it was an opportunity to, to really dig into that question and make sure you did have a common understanding. Um, and so I, I appreciate that. Um, with all those big questions, the fundamentals that we've been talking about throughout this presentation all still apply, um, that if you have a good process, if you have some fundamental agreements about what our product is, what we're trying to accomplish, that you regularly revisit uh, and uh, reaffirm or adjust as you need to. Um, and really valuing that every person in the conversation has a piece of the truth, and it's important for us to find ways to hear all those pieces, to incorporate them into a conversation, uh, and to use that as a resource that then builds the strength of the group. Um, so that's really what we want to make sure that you all hear from us today in, in terms of the, the basic processes and products and stages of development, um, how, to, how to think about your meetings, and I, again, I know that there have been a lot of questions uh, coming in throughout the course of the presentation. I'm wondering if, Joel, you can um, tell us, uh, is there something that um, we might start with? Sure. Let's see what we have time for here. Uh, we have a question from Pamela Baldwin. Pamela asks, uh, co-ops, startups like ours, tend to be populated by people who are very busy, not just with the co-op project. How can the co-op, how can the group adapt its work to the competing priorities and demands of the group's members when not everybody can be available, even at fairly critical times. Boy, isn't that the truth of it. Um, and uh, probably not something where there's going to be one simple answer. But I wonder if, Art, you might um, 
take a take a try at that. How how do you deal with that situation where people are so busy and there are sometimes critical needs? Well, this is challenging, and I think that um, making sure that you really take advantage of people's past experience so that you make those predictable problems. And you're going to be able to uh, identify when certain things are going to be really intense and uh, at least get people geared up for that and try to time it around also knowable events in the calendar around holidays, etc. So a lot of it is anticipating, knowing that there are going to be those times and preparing for them. I, I think it's uh, I think it's critical to take a look forward, um, and that's a, certainly an important part of the leadership role of whoever's whoever's playing that role on the team. Uh, one thing I would add to that, um, Pamela, is that in the last week's uh, webinar, Ben and I suggested that one thing that a steering committee can do is to clearly delegate to uh, task groups and so that the, the decision making, if everybody's busy doing everything, it gets really hard. Um, but if there's ways to delegate some responsibility to task groups so that the primary steering committee group um, isn't necessarily all the same people doing all the work, then that's the group that comes together to make decisions. Um, in between those decision-making meetings and there are other activities happening um, outside of the meeting and, and perhaps with other volunteers involved. That might be worth considering is, is how do you delegate out some of the work of the, of the project. Um, great question uh, and again a tough one. Uh, Joel, is there something else that we might try to address today? Sure, yeah, actually maybe we can feed two birds with one hand here. Um, we are in a situation, this is from Lori Freeman, and we are in a situation where we have board members that do not see following the policy manual as important and others that see it as critical. And if we need to update the policies, we should do that so we have a document that states how we do business. Um, can you speak to that a bit? Wow, really gets to the core of what are those agreements and why do we make them? Um, Ben, I wonder if, if there's anything in your experience that would help you think about that. What do you do when people have different approaches to whether it matters or not what we've agreed to? Yeah, that's 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 hard. Um, and I think some, you know, I think you have to ask the group and ask the people involved. You know, have we already agreed on this? Is this are we? Do we need to change this? Are you not agreeing with an earlier decision that was made? Because I think uh, it's pretty key that everybody agrees on what these, you know, foundational resources say and how we're interpreting them. Um, so, you know, if we've agreed that we're going to follow the policy register or whatever other uh, thing we've laid out to show how we're going to do our work, you know, probably built into that is some kind of recourse. And of course, you don't want to be punitive, but it's also worth saying, you know, we agreed to this before. If you don't agree now, then we need to discuss that and talk about why did something change? Do you feel it's not serving our process and our product? What, what's, how do we, you know, move past this? Um, and ultimately, you have to see whether is this just a case of somebody who now is no longer moving the process forward, but is being uh, barrier to the process, and then if you get to that point, then you do have to think about, well, would we be better off if someone else was in that person's role? You know, it might also be uh, an exemplification of the tension between process and product, and one of the causes of half the group might maybe wanting to follow policy versus half the group saying, let's not follow policy, is that some folks are feeling that the policy is actually not actually facilitating the ability to get things done. Instead, it may just be holding back. And so it may be worth stepping back and asking the question, is this help? What was our original reason for this, and is it helping us accomplish that? Yeah, good. So, so having built into the process uh, the chance to check in, 
why do, why is this agreement here and is it serving us so rather than us trying to serve the policies or the agreements they should serve us and so regularly being able to check in and ask each other about that and reaffirm our commitment to whatever our agreements are and one other thing that might uh, it won't help in that moment, but can help um, alleviate some of those uh, um, events, I think, is to have a, a good orientation when people come into a group, to let them know that what they're walking into is a group with an established set of norms and agreements. And part of coming into the group is accepting that. Um, we don't want to have to start from scratch every time someone joins the group. So that's part of that uh, group development stages. Um, if we always are having to go back to zero every time one person leaves or another person comes in, we'll never move forward. Uh, so we've got to have some basic agreements and when people join the group knowing this is what you're joining. And then as, as Art and Ben have said, regularly reevaluating those together. Uh, and it, is it one person's issue or an issue of many people um, not agreeing? Uh, all those things would be part of the, the calculus. But again, it's, a, it's not an uncommon scenario and uh, one that um, you, know, you can learn from each other about also how you dealt with it in various uh, startup groups. Boy, you all have got some good questions today. I wonder, Joel, do we have a, an, another one that you could um, toss out for us? I, uh, I do. Uh, let's see. Well, here's one from Trisha Fuller. Uh, she asks, when do you get the public involved in the process? Well, Tricia, good. So very kind of a practical piece on starting up. Um, so Ben, maybe in, in Friendly City, how did you all think about that, getting the public involved? Um, well, yeah, and that, that's uh, at times we wanted to have the public vote on everything, and then we realized that that's not good governance and it's not going to get our work done. Um, so there was a process of understanding that, you know, we're putting a lot of effort to learn a lot of stuff, so that's why we're in our role as board members or founding team members. Um, but I think what was key was having a very open communications with the membership in the community. So uh, although we didn't necessarily ask for, um, we didn't ask for public votes, but we often asked for public help, we would uh, put out there through all the means that we used through email blasts and um, uh, our website, Facebook page, and in-person meetings, we would talk about what, our, what stage we were in the process right then and what our current needs were, whether they were financial or uh, governance or people. Um, we would uh, communicate, basically. So we tried to have the community and the membership involved in that way throughout the process. Um, and then, of course, you know they're welcome to come and attend board meetings, run for the board, and take part in that way too. Um, so it was pretty clear that they could communicate with us in a variety of ways, and they could also be a part of the larger decision-making process by taking on a bigger role as you know coming to the board meetings and and running for the board. Uh, and again, if if uh, any of you all didn't get a chance to sit in on last week's webinar. Um, ben talked a fair bit about, in the, con in the context of accountability, how uh, does a startup group uh, be accountable to the larger community, um, which is, uh, as Ben said, it's not the same as having everybody vote on everything, but to make sure they're included in the conversation and their voices are heard and that they get a chance to hear from you all, the leaders of this project. So uh, I know there's more questions than we're going to have time to answer today and what I would like to uh, encourage is for any of y'all who didn't um, get your question answered to uh, think about contacting uh, one of us uh, outside of this webinar. Uh, maybe you will also find some answers in some of these other uh, resources that we've got here. Um, this uh, set of slides will be posted um, with all the other webinar presentations in the Food Co-op Initiative series for startups. I want to encourage you to go and check out those. Um, I'm wondering if we can uh, take a minute here to say our goodbyes. Um, and then if, Joel, there's anything you want to make sure folks hear about uh, closing out the webinar, we'll check in with you last. Um, so, Art, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Michael. It was a lot of fun. Good deal. 
And Ben, it was really a, a treat to be working with you on two of these webinars this week. Thanks a bunch. You're welcome, and thank everybody. Thank you to everybody out there for working on this. Yeah, it's really such a such a pleasure to know that the work that we're doing is uh, working in conjunction with all you folks out there and all the various communities around the country, making startup co-ops happen because that's the kind of world I want to live in, one that's full of cooperatives everywhere. So thank you for all the work you're doing and for your time and attention today. And Joel, is there anything we should know about um, the next steps in, in terms of people's participation here today? Well, uh, once we close out, there's going to be a small survey we'd love if you could take. And if you haven't registered for next week's webinar, which is the last webinar in this series, uh, it's going to be on starting a new buying club with Stuart Reed and Jake Schlachter from Food Co-op Initiative. So if you haven't already registered for that one, check it out on our CDS website or on the library. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you all so much. Bye now.